that's something to think about how to build up a client base. How do I go about getting clients? Who are my clients going to be? So I've covered who I think they should be, but you might really like a certain area and certain process and you've really got skills in that area. And that might be an area that you want to develop, whether it's going down the insurance schemes or other third party schemes. Welcome to X Who's Biz with me, Aaron King, a podcast for exercise physiologists and health professionals wanting to grow and scale in business. Hi, and welcome to X Fizz Biz. Today, I'm discussing one of the most common and necessary frequently asked questions that I get when people are starting out or trying to grow their health business. And it centers around clients. How do I get clients? Who should my clients be? Where do they come from? And what if it doesn't work? So how to build up a client base is today's episode. Obviously, it's important and it's one of the first things that people need to think about and should think about because you can't start a business without clients or you can't maintain a business without clients. Although most of us go into health to help people, if you're then going into your own business, you need to start to balance the needs of the business and that is cash and cash flow and getting money in and turnover to be able to actually grow and expand and then provide an experience for the clients because without money, without clients, you can't and then continue to provide a better experience for clients ongoing. Now, how do I go about getting them? In my view, private clients are the key to exercise physiology and to most other health. Because I mentioned in previous episodes that all the third-party schemes tend to change based on who's in government or what's happening in the market or the industry or the organization that is governing it trying to change their structure. If you look at DVA Medicare, they froze their rates for 10 years and they did it across all health professions and most of medicine as well, that it almost forced health providers out of that space or then they had to charge a gap while people were being told, look, we're not making a co-payment or things like that. But when you freeze Medicare rebates for 10 years, and obviously all costs go up over that time, then you can't reasonably see clients for the price that it was 10 years ago. Everything has gone up. Same with DVA, there was a freeze on it. And there's also other layers which provide protections to the clients that they're not over-serviced, which is great. But on the other side of it, it's put in many barriers that are probably unnecessary. So there was probably a need to find a middle ground, especially for DVA. With NDIS, it's working really well, but things can change. And also with work cover, that's changed as well. So every third-party scheme at some point in its development, growth, or maturity has changed in the way that it operates. So for those that are putting all their eggs in one basket, they may really have to change their entire business model. But if you're not putting all your eggs in one basket and you're diversifying the types of clients you see, then any one singular change isn't going to be fatal to your business. And that's why I've always maintained that private clients for me and for my business and many others around are the key to EP because with private clients, they're deciding to see you for whatever reason they have to see you and you see them. Obviously, there's a balance. You don't want to over-service the clients that are more intake, treat, discharge. But then on top of that, there are other clients that are not those intake, treat, discharge types of clients and they're happy to see you at regular intervals, whether it be for accountability, to maintain their general exercise, to maintain whatever it is that they're working on from a personal point of view, rehab, you're obviously looking at discharging from that point, but there are other clients that are not rehab. They might be athletes that have a career over a decade, or they might be private clients that just want to work with a health professional rather than another industry professional. There are all different reasons why somebody might see you, but if they're a private client, they're making the decision to spend their own money. So I would say that the majority of your client base, or at least half, should be focused on private clients that aren't going to change as a whole based on what organization changes their rules. Obviously, private clients, are going to be susceptible to inflation, to job changes, to things like that. And that's obviously happening at the moment, but not all of them. I think a smaller percentage of those clients that are seeing you would be affected compared to if your whole business is work cover and they change the rules, then obviously your entire client base. So a smaller percentage would be affected. And even then, if you're seeing half of your database is private clients, then half of your database is not affected. So that's something to think about how to build up a client base. How do I go about getting clients? Who are my clients going to be? So I've covered the wife think they should be, but you might really like a certain area and certain process and you've really got skills in that area. And that might be an area that you want to develop, whether it's going down the insurance schemes or other third party schemes. So it's not to say that it's not to be done because if that's your niche and that's what you really know and love, then by all means, 
go ahead and do it because you're better off doing what you're more passionate about and also what you know where your skill set lies because you'll actually be better at it and more likely to start off with better clients for you and get better results. And that obviously has a flow on effect of growing your business. So how do I go about getting those? Well, determining what clients you want and who they are and where they are first. Because at the end of the day, somebody can have the best product that nobody knows about. The most known aren't always the best product, whether it be in the health industry, the fitness industry, or any industry, the most well-known products aren't always the best. Often they're the best marketed over time and the product themselves has got better and more succinct over time and it's improved, but it definitely wasn't like that at the start. My thought is, is that you want both of those things. You want a really good product, but you also want to market it well and understand what people want. Now, I have issues with people creating problems that don't exist then to market a product to the market. And that's happening massively on socials where people create unnecessary barriers and entry to exercise and confuse people and then people don't take action. So going down that path, I don't recommend just creating an issue to then sell a product because there's way too many people already doing that. And I don't think that's the way forward and that should be the way forward. But you definitely need to make sure that you get a quality product and you also then have it marketable. Now, we've developed products like during COVID, we had to develop a product where we went online. Well, we didn't have an online product at that time. So we didn't have it final by the time we started to roll it out because by the time they said, yep, you can't operate in the same way, we had to change it. And within a week, we were seeing clients online and we had a product of delivering their exercises online, delivering their list of exercises, their sets, their reps, so they understood what they were doing, making videos and all of this and we were providing in an app or an online portal for them at that time. With their programs, we were only a week or two ahead to start. So we basically just developed the first two weeks. So you don't have to even have a final product. You want to have in your mind what the final product looks like and what it wants to achieve, but it doesn't have to be fully built. So you can start before you've even finished it because if you're trying to finish your product and then you're trying to make it perfect, you'll end up never getting it out there. 80% and out is better than 100% and no one ever sees it. So keeping that in mind that you want to get the product, it doesn't have to be finished, but it has to be ahead of where the client is with the end goal in mind. So you're not just hacking on as you go and just making it up. You still want to have the framework, but it doesn't have to be finished. Like I said, when we went online, we were only two weeks ahead of the clients initially, but now we continue to see people online and we're years ahead of where they need to be. And we've developed a number of products that are available online and offline, meaning face-to-face. But initially we only had a, not even a week to get it out because we wanted to maintain our seeing our client. So where do I get clients when I'm starting out? I'm not a fan of all service industries are told, oh, do you want to build your portfolio, work with me, things like this. Photographers get it, trainers get it. People that are in a service-based industries get a lot of these things. Now, if you're starting out and you don't have any testimonials, you don't have anything to show for it, and your plan is to market to people online, maybe working with some clients at the start for a low cost because it's a marketing expense for either a low cost or no cost and sign a contract with them that, look, we will be able to take photos. You can write a report, write some information about how we work together and I'll use your experience as a case study. Are you okay with that? So you might build your portfolio, so to speak, if you don't have clients, if you're planning to market online. Now, if you're offline and knocking on doors, maybe you're not going to go around with a portfolio folder and do that. So maybe it's not worth it for that person that is not going to go online, but you need to make the own decision, your own decision for you. Do you already have a network? Say you want to see an athlete or a private type of client in a group, or where do I already know these from? Now, you don't want to go to other established places and knock on the doors and just try to take clients. That's absolutely not the way to go about it. And you'll get yourself into strife and you'll get a reputation if you're trying to do that and take clients from other businesses. But if you already have a personal network, who you know, who's online, who's offline, who you've already connected with, you can start there. Like when I started off knocking on the doors of doctors and sending some emails. Now, in hindsight, it worked and we still have many of those connections to the local doctors. But I found that we were starting with Medicare clients and they would come for two to three times, however many times they were referred under their care plan, low cost, they would come in and then they're finished and then they either choose to continue to work with you and some or many of them in my view don't because they're looking, they've been told, are oh, you getting some free sessions because we were bulk billing at the time, you're getting some free sessions and there's that mindset. And that was pretty hard initially because every two or three sessions, you're just trying to get new clients. But then we diversified and we've got some work cover. We worked with local 
physios, other health providers that weren't providing what we were doing in-house and they were happy to work with us. And then we expanded and obviously we're a few years down the line now and we've got our own network over that time. So knocking on doors, I don't think that's done enough. Like I don't think sending an email works because I get dozens of spam emails and I'd call them spam of just cold emailing to advertise a service. To, hey, this is what we do. And you might, if they blast it out to thousands, they might get one or two and it might you might get lucky. But in my view, they don't work all that well. But if you're going to see your local network, knocking on the doors of providers, so they're seeing you, seeing your face, seeing what you do and how you work and having the chat, realizing that other people are busy and it's about what you can provide them and working together for mutual benefit. It's not, hey, this is what I do, me, me, me. It's about them. How can you make their job easier? So knocking on the doors. So I started off knocking on the doors of, I just looked at online and went, where are the local doctors? And I already knew most of them because I lived in the area for decades. So I already knew a few of them, knew where they were. And I just knock on the door, chat to the gatekeeper, which is obviously the medical receptionist. Sometimes you would get in, sometimes you'd wait, sometimes you wouldn't. And you don't need to be everything to everyone and you don't need to have a large network, but you might have one physio, one chiro, one or two or three doctors, depending upon their specialty in an area. You might have a sports team. You might have one or two of each thing because I don't recommend having too many in your network of the same industry. For me personally, I'd prefer to have, say, one physiotherapist that you work with that is in a geographical area because at the end of the day, if you have three or four that work in the same area and they're likely to see the same clients, well, which one do you refer to? When do you refer to each one? And if they understand that you've got three or four, they're like, well, this person doesn't really trust and know me either. So I'm less likely to refer out to them. I might look elsewhere. So it works both ways. If you have the trust in someone that you know, like, and trust and understand their work, then they're more likely to do it to you. Now, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, but I would prefer to just have one of a type of other health professional in an area they can work with. So it might be, you know, one OT, one industry it is. Because if you have more, I don't feel that it works out all that well. Now, initially, we looked at a number of different options, a number of different people, but then you only end up finding one or, one or two of that industry anyway, because some people already have their own network and they're happy with them and that's fine, but others don't, others aren't looking and they do things internally. So you just need to think about which doors you're knocking on and whether it's appropriate, because obviously if you're an EP and you're knocking on the door of somebody else, but then you realize, okay, they already do EP internally, then it's probably not, not going to work out that way. But it's fine to still have them in your network and know that they're around because look, we all know each other at the end of the day and there's enough clients for everybody and it's not really a problem because basically more than 50% of the population should be able to be helped by a health professional and supported because that's just what the obesity stats, the health stats represent, especially in many areas of Sydney where I am, I think it's close to 60% either have a health condition or are obese or have some form of thing that can be supported. So if you look at, look, every second person might need your support it means there's enough for everybody. So you can knock on doors and find that. And I think that's probably a lost art. People just want to send an email, send a quick social message, but people seeing your face, seeing what you do, having a presence can be helpful. So where else are your clients? Obviously knocking on the doors to create those connections. Where else are they? So who has clients that you would like to see that is also not doing what you are doing, but would also benefit from you being involved in their network as well? So you might even be a support coordinator or another type of worker within the NDIS industry as an example, because they don't do what you do, but they might find you beneficial to their network. Meet, offer services, network, meetings, other businesses. When I started out, I went to a local networking group. It was, it's called BNI. It's still around at the moment. There's still a number of ones that operate around the world and they're global. There are a number of other similar services. So that was basically a who's who of local businesses. There are many people that go to it. There might be 20 or 30 people at a meeting of other local businesses. And the goal is to meet other local businesses, network, know, like, and trust them. And then you end up sharing services within each other. And that I still have clients and I still have a business network. My accountant came from that group. My business coach came from local networking. There are a number of things that even though I'm not currently meeting in those groups of a morning, I still network with a number of those businesses. And also it was a good starting point, starting out knowing who's who. I got to know people, local counselors. I got to know local business people that were basically the who's who of local business. And I still connect with them and still know them and they know me. And we still work together in different capacities. Now, another one is direct selling or marketing on socials. Obviously, when I started out, it wasn't as popular. I don't Facebook was around, but obviously it wasn't the same way. And that's how Facebook makes money. They have it free to the customer or the consumer, but pay to play for businesses, basically. So you could find who you want and you could target them directly on socials. 
and provide them an experience and do it that way. Now, I didn't do it that way initially because that wasn't really an available service that I went down and it wasn't as developed as it is now, but it's an option now. And that's where that portfolio that I spoke about earlier might come into play because if you don't have marketing images, you don't have content that people can click on that sort of stop people scrolling in their tracks, then it's not going to help. But my experience was local business networking and local health professionals, local medical professionals, and I still have though many of those connections today. Some of them have changed, served us well and vice versa for a period of time. And we've moved on because businesses change, some businesses stop operating, some businesses change how they operate or they diversify themselves. So I wouldn't rely just on one connection, but I would begin starting out that way and then you can build that but hopefully you don't in time put all your eggs in one basket but at the same time when I say that there was one specific person in my network that had the most impact on our growth because there was a short period of time where we got funneled a lot of clients that moved on from their service but suited our service and that was really a great impetus for our business to grow so although I say don't put all your eggs in one basket when you have no connections maybe your first connection that works out will be all your eggs but then you still need to develop further connections or develop direct marketing and direct sales to your clients. So as I said before, you don't want to, but you don't want to dilute it too much because I recommend having a few connections of the same provider, but spread out across different areas. Like we've got one physio in one geographic area, but maybe another one further out where they don't impact and they're not competitors because those clients that would see one, they're not within a geographic area that they're willing to see another, or they both have their own niche that they don't cross over to the other type of physio. So we only have basically one per area area per niche or style so we don't dilute our connections because if you're diluting your connections then it's not going to work and I think they'll realize and it just the relationship won't work. Networking works, Facebook and socials can work but I do believe that it's getting harder especially with so many ads and things that are going on at the moment. It's basically a higher cost to acquire new clients via that and as well there's so much junk and so much data online that people don't take it in as much or they might be looking in the wrong areas so it's about getting your name out there but just having a presence. Like I don't even think a website is totally necessary these days, but it might just provide some sort of clarity or legitimacy to your business to have one. And that's why you have something around Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever you use, have a profile on all of these with some content there, just because it provides some level of legitimacy, because not everybody nowadays will search Google or search online. People might prefer to search visually through Instagram or find an address via Facebook or Google Maps or whatever it may be. So having a presence on an appropriate social site is just going to provide some level of legitimacy. In my view, networking really works and it's probably been the biggest catalyst to us growing rather than the online portion of that. Online has been great, but at least initially, networking locally worked the most, especially because if you are local to where you're setting up or you're planning to set up there, you need to know and it's important for people to know you and you know them locally because geographically, there's an understanding. Like if I was going to an area that I wasn't familiar with, with people that I wasn't familiar with that sort of didn't believe that I was one of them, so to speak, then it may not work out. But I guess if I'm coming from a, an area where I understand the clients, understand what they need, and I can empathize, sympathize, and support them, then yeah. you're only going to do better that way. So it's finding some level of commonality with your client that it creates a bit more trust. And you want to make sure that comes from a genuine approach, not just bullshitting them really. But I found that was beneficial because I think at the end of the day, people want to be seen by people they know, like, and trust. And also sometimes I like them and understand them. And you don't need to be your client and you don't need to provide, you don't need to have good advice. You don't need to do everything that you're telling the client to do. But if you think there's an element of people that if I didn't train, if I didn't exercise, people may not trust me. Just like if there's a doctor that smokes and they're providing them with no smoking advice, would you really trust that doctor? You should. And you should be able to because the advice is correct. It's not like they're uneducated or the per the exercise physiologist that doesn't exercise is not educated in exercise, but for whatever reason, they're not doing it. But it just for the average Joe, it provides some level of legitimacy and understanding ending. Now, it may not be necessary if you're working with Olympic athletes, like maybe not always the, uh, the elite coaches look like they could do the sport anymore and fair enough, but you're dealing with the elite people. But if you're dealing with the average Joe practicing what you preach, I think is important, especially in the early phases. But as well, if you're an exercise physiologist, you should probably exercise regularly because it's part of your job, part of your understanding, and you do develop skills by teaching yourself and doing that first before you relay it to clients. And hopefully you do like it. We obviously don't like it always, but you should do it just because it's like brushing your teeth. You just do it. Now, moving on, as I said, networking works, and I think that's probably the biggest 
thing that worked for me, online networking, knocking on doors, where can I get them? Who do I need to network with? Because if we look at the industry stats, people in finding jobs a couple of years ago, most of it was online via employment sites, via Seek, and that's around 35%. Networking word of mouth came in at just under 25%. So that was the second largest percentage of people that found their current role. Now, there are a number of jobs that were created or opportunities that were created at around 5%. And that's other industry websites approaching the company directly. A position was created for me. Even I created the position. So that's, I guess, starting a business around 5%. While I secured the role while on placement or studying. And then the ones that are really only a few percent that volunteer through the alumni network or job recruiting agency. So that was really low there as well. So if you look at it, networking is right up there to look for work or create your own work. So I think that crosses over into if you've been able to find your current position and people are looking to hire people from their network, that shows that people are willing to work with other people and cross industries or cross qualifications in their network as well. Because if you know somebody, it's less risky. And that's for me hiring people as well. I would much prefer people that I already know and understand rather than somebody that's coming in for an hour and you're just interviewing them and seeing how they work. It's a lot harder to judge someone right now, but if someone's done a five-week placement, they've done 100 hours or whatever it may have been, obviously you've been able to assess them over that time and it's been a job interview, whether in your network or somebody that you know, like, and trust tells you, hey, this person's good. They're putting their trust on the line for this person that may be better. So when people are looking for employees, network is a major thing. So that would mean that crossing over that if people are looking to work with others, then networking is also equally important. So I think at the end of the day, simply knocking on doors and organic marketing, who do you know, starting from there and trying to get known in the industry and known around the area that you're starting your business, direct selling marketing, both online and offline. You can even look at what opportunities, what sports teams they can connect with. Who do you want to see? Where are they? What services can you offer? And it might come under your marketing budget. You might not provide a discount, but you might provide extra services and that's the way that I prefer to approach it because sometimes if you provide a discount on your prices, then there's the expectation that your prices are cheap and you're not valuable with what you do. And then you get people that are price shopping and maybe not your ideal client. But if you value your service, you might say, look, we give you extra services. For example, it's better to say you get two sessions. I'm going to give you an extra session instead of I'll give you 50% off because at the end of the day, 50% off just has a negative mindset of, okay, you're a discount. That's how much your service is worth, but I'll give you extra services services, extra value, give you something extra online. Yeah, you might still be giving it for free, but it still hasn't lost value when you're giving them extra rather than discounting it, even though it's the same at the end of the day. So develop your product, develop your niche, doesn't have to be finished, build your portfolio if it's necessary, start with your network and then work out from there, both online and offline. And if this has helped, then like, share, subscribe, comment, and send us a message. Thank you.